go for it, Natalie. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, we are honored to host Dr. David Ivanov. Dr. Ivanov was born in the United States to parents that had recently immigrated from Russia as refugees. After graduating high school, Dr. Ivanov attended two community colleges in the Sacramento area, Sierra College and the American River College. He later transferred to UC Davis where he majored in biochemistry and molecular biology. Dr. Ivanov received his medical degree from the prestigious Mayo Clinic Alex School of Medicine in Rochester, Minnesota. Now that he's graduated, Dr. Ivanov is continuing his medical training at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Stanford School of Medicine, where he's learning the skills needed to be an orthopedic surgeon. If you have any questions for Dr. Ivanov, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A section. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Ivanov. Awesome, thank you for having me. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so yeah, I, you know, when Juven asked me to you know, give this talk, you know, I, I thought about it for quite some time, just you know, what am I gonna say? What kinds of things I'm gonna talk about? Because I remember so, so well being a pre-med, I spent a lot of time you know, first, recruit, you know, attending talks like this as a community college student and um, remembering all the speakers that made an impression on me. And then I remember, you know, working with AMSA and um, the pre-med conference at Davis later on as a recruiter for speakers to talk. And uh, it's kind of interesting, kind of nice to sort of be on the other side now and um, having achieved something, also one of those people now that maybe has something to something to say, something to offer for other aspiring physicians out there. Um, so it's uh, definitely an honor to, you know, kind of pay it forward and just kind of talk to some of the, some of the youngsters who are uh, just starting out. Uh, so uh, my background is, you know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit unique, I think. Uh, it, I wasn't necessarily a traditional pre-medical student, traditional medical student. Um, when I you know, growing up, I was in a, my background, something much more working class, everyone I knew, you know, especially the guys, you know, weren't necessarily going to go to school, they were necessarily going to college, they were all gearing up for careers as, uh, you know, mechanics, truck drivers, construction workers, that sort of thing. And um, I don't know, I, I kind of wanted something, something more, I, I dreamt, dreamt a little bit bigger, even though I had a, a deep respect for the people who you know, we work those jobs and sort of hone those crafts. Um, and that's, you know, that's actually probably why I became an orthopedic surgeon. And ultimately it was kind of a reflection of my sort of admiration for sort of the, the working class kind of jobs that everyone I knew around me had. Um, so in high school, you know, again, wasn't really like a college bound student. I, I did well enough. I like to read a lot of books. And so that was a big advantage for me, but I, you know, it, not being someone who was college bound, I wasn't necessarily someone who studied for the SAT. I, I took the SAT without studying, without really even knowing what it was. I just, I knew or I thought, you know, it's a test I'm supposed to take, I guess. I didn't think I would go to university. I had no plans to go to university after, after high school. You know, ultimately, I was like, well, I might as well go to community college. American River College was, you know, 10 minutes from my house. Uh, people I knew had attended there, you know, a lot of, a few of the people in my high school, the people who were even going to go to college, most of them were talking about just going to which community college they would go to. So uh, American River College was just a natural kind of next step for me. Um, I, my experience at community college was definitely unique. Actually, it probably wasn't that unique. It's unique for people who go to medical school but it was pretty common for you know, the people that I grew up with, you know, a lot, we just took classes, explored, didn't really have a necessarily um, a tract going through community college. I initially was, I thought it'd be a psychology major, it just seemed kind of interesting. Um, and I wasn't, I wasn't that good of a student. I didn't have good study skills from high school because I didn't really try that hard. And in community college, I just remember kind of being content with doing like well enough. Like if I got a B, I was like, okay, that's pretty good. Not, not, that's not bad. And then I, again, I had no goal. No, I was just taking classes, just figuring things out. And um, eventually I, 
through multiple different sort of things that popped into my head. I, you know, I started exploring this idea of being a physician. I, I knew I wanted to do something with science. I knew I wanted to do something that would require a lot of thinking. I, 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 lo I love to read and I actually truly love knowledge. And so I wanted to do something where I would use a specialized set of knowledge, but also use it to directly help people. Um, and I just, something about the challenge of becoming a physician, feeling like I was an underdog because I'm just this kid who doesn't even know a physician, who hasn't seen a physician himself in like 10 years, you know, deciding that I've heard, you know, I've heard that you can become a physician. You can, you know, you study really a long time and then you get to master this incredible source of knowledge that is beneficial to every other person in the world. And you get to practice this and apply it. And I, I decided what the heck, I need a goal. I'm just kind of aimlessly drifting along through community college. And so I, you know, I thought about it some more. I saw this flyer just in a hallway somewhere at ARC, um, you know, talk about AMSA. So I started attending these meetings, like thinking it's a little bit ridiculous. Like, why, why am I here? Like, why, why would I become a doctor? How could I become a doctor? I, my GPA is not even good. I don't do that well in school. Like you, the people you know who become doctors are these people who have 4.0s, you know, since they were five and they, you know, they play violin and et cetera, et cetera. I, re I really wasn't one of those people. And so I didn't, I didn't think it was actually a realistic goal, but I liked having a goal. And so I started attending these meetings and I think, um, after hearing other people talk at meetings like this, I started to think maybe I actually could do this. Um, and I started in my desire to go into medicine sort of evolved. I realized that it is a, just a, such a noble craft, at least in my mind it was. Um, and I, but then that presented me with this dilemma. I, like, I had to ask myself like pretty explicitly in my mind, like, what am I doing? how am I going to get to medical school just, you know, being this kid in community college is kind of coasting by. I needed to learn how to, first of all, I needed to change. I thought I needed to change my major because I was just taking um, psychology classes. At this point, I had actually, after a year at ARC, I had me and my friends were just kind of casually taking classes together for fun, decided we would go to Sierra College because we thought it was for a dumb reason, we thought it was a nicer campus. Like it just, we weren't even thinking, thinking about the future. We were just making these just decisions. Uh, so I was at, at Sierra College at this point too. So I was kind of uh, commuting between both colleges and I was, it was actually kind of nice because I could, if I didn't get into, you know, organic chemistry, one campus, I could try to get into the other. Um, so that was actually kind of a useful split for me, but um I had to learn how to be a good student. And I think that community college was for me an excellent opportunity to be the sort of training ground. Like I didn't have that in high school. I, I didn't learn how to take notes, you know, how to, how to teach yourself. That wasn't, a, those weren't really skills that I had honed. Like I was pretty good at taking classes and memorizing things. I was pretty good at it, but it wasn't uh, something that was structured for me. It wasn't something that was intentional. If it was interesting, I would learn it. If it wasn't interesting, I wouldn't do well and I wouldn't learn it. So I think that was a big, um, big useful part about going to community college. And uh, maybe some of you could kind of relate to that. Some of the audience members who either are in community college or I don't know, plan to attend or did, did attend. Community college is a, a, an excellent opportunity for that. I had to I learned that I couldn't just show up to class, just, just jot some things down in a notebook and then just kind of look at it the day before the test and get good grades because, well, you, everyone knows to go into medical school, you do have to have a good GPA. And I ultimately, you know, I definitely worked hard on my GPA and, and you know, towards the end, I definitely demonstrated a nice upward trend, which is what the admissions committees want to see when they're ultimately selecting people to come into medical school is they, they want to know that you can do well at hard classes and you could do that consistently through years, not just one year, one semester, one quarter. They want to see that you are able to consistently perform at a high level. And that's something that you have to demonstrate. And community college helped me learn how to do that. And, um, 
you know, everyone has different learning styles. It's hard to prescribe a specific type of learning that you could do to get better at that sort of thing. But there are certain strategies that are particularly um, useful. I know this is not really the point of this talk, but I mean, this is something that I've reflected on a lot since, uh, since I've been on this path and thinking about, thinking about learning and learning styles. And the biggest thing if the, to take away from that is I think for everyone here, you know, who's an aspiring pre-med, um, you have to avoid passive learning. I think that, and that's the, that's sort of the default, right? You come to class, your teacher says some things, you look down, you write them on your paper. You're actually disengaging from what's going on in the class. You're just writing down the words when you're just sort of robotically looking at the teacher, writing down what they're writing on the board or saying out loud, and then just jotting them all down. You're not really engaging with the material and that's, um, and you've lost the opportunity to be in a classroom setting and hearing that material fresh thinking about it, observing the teacher's hand gestures, their emphasis, that sort of thing, what, where, they, where they're highlighting, et cetera, et cetera. And so you just sort of robotically jot things down. And then when you get home, you kind of just, you study. And by study, you just kind of read your notes. At least that's what I used to do. And that's not a very effective way of learning. Like there's a lot of research that shows that passive learning is not very good. And, but that is, if you don't know how to study, if no one's taught you how to study and learn, that's probably what you end up doing. Um, or downloading your professor's slides and just reading them. That's not, that's not enough. Um, so I, I had to, I learned that. I learned that what I was doing wasn't good enough. And luckily I learned that at community college where, you know, the teachers are much more supportive. The classes are smaller. And frankly, the teachers are better. They're, they, they teach you better because they, the reason they go into teaching at a community college is purely for teaching. And I, I love my professors at Davis and some of them were excellent. And many of them were excellent, but some people become professors also to do research, especially at like a research institution like UC Davis, for instance. And again, uh, great school, had a great time there, but there's a difference between a community college professor and a, you know, a university professor, I think. So the, the key to studying, I would say, is you have to actively process the information that you are interacting with. You have to interact with it. Um, when, you, when you're listening, when you're in lecture, ideally you are recording or they're recording the lecture for you so you don't have to take notes in real time. And instead, treat lecture like a conversation and follow along. When someone, when the professor tells you a statement or explains a concept, you have to, instead of looking away and write, writing down the concept on your paper, you have to let the concept em enter your mind and process it and understand what's happening. Um, and then you actually will learn something. So you gain a little bit of context about why that's important. And the reason I'm spending so much time talking about it is that was a big, uh, big revelation for me in terms of learning how to study. And again, the whole point is you gotta study, because you have to do well, you got to get good grades. Obviously, you have to do a lot more and just get good grades, but you have to get good grades. And I had to learn how to do that. Um, I, I spent five years at community college, which is people are pretty shocked when I tell them that, and, you know, when I was a medical student, like people were just like, couldn't relate. They're like, my degree took four years, you know, or like three and a half and I'm already in, in medical school. And, and for me, I'm like, wow, that we're completely different people. But I took that long because, one, I started off not being a good student, not being a pre-med, not knowing what I wanted to do. So I took a bunch of random classes. And two, I, you know, again, it was a training ground for me. I had to learn. I had to figure this stuff out. So it took me quite some time. Um, when I decided, okay, I'm going to be a pre-med, you know, that's a whole nother set of classes in general education that you have to take. You know, there's all these science classes, organic chemistry, physics, you know, math, calculus. So you know, even just getting all of those classes at the right time to be able to graduate, you know, trend, you know to um, transfer in two years is, is a challenge. And so a lot of people transfer in three years. So I had two years to just kind of bum around with my friends and just take random fun classes. And then three years to actually, you know, start from scratch, you know, algebra, algebra one, I think I probably took all the biology classes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think, you know, I don't regret the time that I took or the fact that I was at community college. I think um, 
just really, again, a training ground, an opportunity to really learn how to be a student. And if you're in community college now, like this is your time to learn how to be a student. And, it, at the, and it's hard and you need to find mentors. Uh, and the community college is a great place for that because again, classes are small. Professors know you or actually wanna get to know you. And that leads up into my next point, which is what I did successfully was I always sought out mentors, sought out opportunities. I talked to people, I talked to my professors after class. I talked to other people who are going into medicine. I talked to the speakers at the AMSA events afterwards. I, I just wanted to know more. I was hungry for um, just insight. I didn't know anyone who was going into medicine. So it was you know, really important for me to look for that. And so it was professors, you know, I would ask questions in class and then after go to office hours, engage with the material, develop these relationships because one, I mean, this is, it's, it's free. You get free insight, free knowledge, free extra teaching that you can acquire on your own time during these office hours. And you're building these mentorships because you're going to be asking people for letters of recommendation, um, which are a big part of the medical school application process. And if you're, you know, if it's, if you're asking your professors, which you will be, you'll be asking some professors. It doesn't have to be someone at community college, but you'll, ultimately be asking people who've taught you science classes for letters of recommendations. And if they don't really know you besides that you sat in the front and you, you know, you ask a couple of good questions and you got an A in that class, it's not going to be a, a useful letter. Um, so that was another thing I learned in uh, community college. I got involved. Another thing was I had time to get involved in volunteer opportunities and leadership. So one of the one of the earliest sort of volunteer opportunities that I did that I think made a pretty big impact on myself and definitely helped me get to where I am today was I was a hospice volunteer. I would basically sit with people who were I would visit people who were terminally ill who had six months to live or less, and I would provide respite time for their family or their caregivers so that they could go you know uh, to a restaurant with a friend or go to the movies or just go grocery shopping. They could like leave their house um you know and that's not and that, that, you know it's a tough job i mean these people are are dying sometimes they're not verbal it was not always comfortable um, but i think it definitely made an impact on people if it not the patient who maybe doesn't even realize that i'm there but on the caregiver who got to you know go do something else for two hours or so um and that was just an opportunity that i found by just I don't even remember, but it was just looking for opportunities and just um, seeking them out and asking questions. Um, and another thing was leadership. I, you know, I started off AMSA at community college, just talking to people, talking to the speakers that would come. And then when I started taking more of my classes at Sierra College, I realized that there wasn't an AMSA there. So I, you know, I started an AMSA at Sierra College. And I just started stealing all the speakers from uh, ARC's um, AMSA. So that, you know, after they come and say, hey, do you want to give this talk at uh, the other college down the road in Rockland? And, you know, I kind of started off from there. And um, I found a, a, former a former surgeon actually at Sierra College who was an anatomy professor to be the sort of the advisor for the club. And, um, and that was an opportunity for me to learn how to, uh, like, take – go you just become more of a go-getter take action seize opportunities um learn how to learn executive functioning like how to lead a meeting you know how to how to plan one how to schedule one the logistics of all that those are very useful skills and uh, those are skills that you can talk about on your medical school interviews when they ask you what else you did besides you know study and go to school so uh, community college provided me a lot of opportunity to do those types of things because I was going at a little bit of a slower pace, you know, low, community college is, I would say, lower intensity than at the university level. And I think it's a good thing. I think some of us needed it. I definitely did. So again, after these five years at this point, you know, I've, I've been a pre-med for three of those years. And so, um, I, at that point now I was someone who had leadership experience. This is some, I had some clinical experience. Um, with hospice, I did a little bit of hospital volunteering too in the ED. Um, I also developed a good foundation for learning. 
I, I learned, you know, I learned how to learn. I learned how to study. And that was a, that was a huge thing for me. Um, and I just built a solid foundation in the sciences. And that's really important. Um, this is a great opportunity if you're in community college to just build a very strong foundation in basic biology. Um, and the biology professors at community college tend to be very good and they tend to be very passionate, not about research and, you know, the minutia of like protein structures, but they they want to teach basic stuff, basic cell biology, basic um, stuff about proteins, the stuff that you're going to need to learn to do well at university for your upper division bio classes and the stuff that you're going to be tested on for the MCAT. And that's, you know, that's another thing that I also want to spend some time talking about because I have you know, some unique perspective in that I eventually also taught as an MCAT professor, but uh, not professor, MCAT teacher. Um, but after I transferred, so I ended up transferring to Davis. I, it was the most uh, logical choice for me. It was a, a big pre-med program. It was close by. I had never left Sacramento before. Um, and so, you know, no, it's a pretty big transition, a big move for me. I never left the moved out of the house before. Um, so I went to Davis. I luckily I had built a, a strong foundation at uh, American River College. And so I was able to hit the ground running. Um, and that's uh, also another sort of important thing that I wanted to touch on for those of you who are transferring, which I assume everyone who is a community college student ultimate goal is to transfer. Um, hopefully community college sets you up so that you can hit the ground running. Um, taking, you know, again, having a solid foundation in the sciences, solid foundation in bi basic biology, basic uh, chemistry, um, and also, you know, knowing how, to, knowing how to study, to teach yourself. Because um, when I got to university, I, I realized very quickly that uh, the style of teaching was very different. You're now a student uh, in a class of 200 people and there's no there's no more hand holding there's no more you know like special there's no attention on you as a student from the professor because there's 200 people and so you're you're kind of on your own now and so again that the skills i learned in community college are very helpful because i learned how to teach myself i learned how to engage in material um and so um when i started taking classes at you know at uh, davis i focused a lot on repetition i would look at um i would uh, go to lecture i wouldn't take notes necessarily and i don't necessarily think that's a, a, a strategy for everybody but for me i learned a lot from the actual lecture itself i you know i have some component of me is a big auditory learner and so hearing someone explain things and watching them helped me learn and in most lectures at the university level tend to be you know podcasted or recorded and so i would listen to lecture in live in person, try to engage with the material, try to really understand what they were saying. And then when I go home, I would review the lecture, I review the podcast, the recording, and then start taking notes. And a big part of what I focused on was repetition, especially with biology. It, you have to learn a long sequence of information that you don't always have the context for right away. And so um, when I would study, I would look at, I would read whatever concept I'm re reviewing. I would put my notes away and I would try to explain it out loud, either, either to somebody or usually just to myself out loud, what I'm trying to learn. Okay, so this part of the cell does this, the name of that protein is this, it interacts with this. And if I don't remember, I would look down on my notes, remember, and then look away and force myself to recall that information and link those terms, those concepts, independently without looking at it on paper. It's very easy to look at your slides from your professor and say, oh yeah, that makes sense. Yep, yeah, this slide makes sense. I think I understand this. I think I understand this. And then when they ask you, what's the name of the protein that interacts with CPY4, whatever, you, you, you know, you, you will recognize it if you saw it on the slide, but you might not be able to pick it out in a multiple choice question or on a, a free form question. So repetition was very key and Again, you know, to get into medical school, you have to be, you have to be a good student. A medical school is hard. Medical school is hard, and they want they want the best. They want the best and the brightest, and and so you know you have to you really have to demonstrate that you um, can learn. You can learn quickly and consistently. And that's like that's something that can't be understated. I think 
obviously there's so much more that is required of you to get into medical school than just to be a good student, but that's, that's a foundation because they're recruiting students, right? You go to medical school to be a medical student, ultimately a doctor one day, which requires a, a much different uh, set of skills than being a student does, but they are ultimately, they're a school that's looking for good students. And so I, I don't want to, so I think sometimes people think, you know, you, there's all these up, you know, learning uh, other things you have to do, extracurricular is what you do. You do have to do, you kind of have to do it all. It's, it's, it's tough, but a big component of it is learning um, how to learn and show that you're a strong student. And I'm harping on this a lot because I needed that a lot. And I think maybe some of you may too. Um, when I, so when I transferred, I basically had one year to take a series of classes and then, you know, start taking the MCAT. So, you know, the MCAT is a sort of unique, a very unique challenge. And it's sort of one test. It's one time. Okay. Not always one time. You can always retake it, but it's one sort of singular instance in which you have to demonstrate your knowledge of like all of basic science, physics, chemistry, biology. Now it's, I think, a little bit of anatomy too, biochemistry, physics, sociology, um, reading comprehension. That's a lot. Um, my, my tip for, for MCAT, since this is not the fo focus of the talk, I won't delve too much into talking about the MCAT, but one of the tips is, you know, you have to, you, learning the material really well the first time in class is really the key. You, you can't, when you're studying for the MCAT, it's ideally supposed to be like a review of material you're, you already know. Um, if you're in a position where you're learning concepts for the first time when you're studying for the MCAT, ultimately you will some things, but the more of a strong foundation you have, especially in your bio, basic biology and your upper division biology classes, because that's more emphasized now with the newer MCAT that's been out for the last several years now, um, as having a strong grasp of biology. I, my major was biochemistry and molecular biology, and I thought that that was actually a very useful major for me to have because all of the, all the challenging biology stuff on the MCAT was stuff that we did in class, you know. Um, portions of the MCAT now ask you to interpret uh, research design and research results. They'll show you, you know, a gel electrophoresis result, an image of it, and they ask you to interpret three different layers of information to get to the answer. And luckily, you know, in my courses, we we did that. My tests look just like that. You know, we also had an image of a of a gel electrophoresis with the bands, and we had to interpret from there and figure out which is what protein. So, um, learning it the first time is important. Uh, again, it's it's hard to do it all, and it, it, my the point of me harping on being a good student is not to intimidate anybody or scare them away or anything like that. I just think it's, um, it's really important. It's a big part of getting into medical school. Um, let's see. Yeah. Another component was uh, letters of recommendation. That was also tough and it's really hard to, it's hard to get a sense for what that is like, how that works you know they don't like they're they're all this, all the schools you'll go to will have some sort of sort of pre-med advising component to it and some schools are have are better at it than others um, luckily for me i had been involved in amsa in community college and then also the uc davis pre-medical conference for actually several years where i met a lot of people who are also interested in medical school um, i met a lot of speakers people who are either administrators at medical schools professors even a dean or two that I met who, you know, gave me some insight on letters of recommendation. And that's another reason why I think getting involved is important. Go to your AMSA meetings, meet these people, listen to them talk. They'll come and they'll tell you what they look for in letters of recommendation. And it's best to hear it from people who actually look at them. Your pre-med advisor can definitely help, but they're not actually making decisions on who goes into medical school. And so it, you know, you really want to, broaden the information you're receiving and a great way to do that is you know going to talks like these going to the emsa meetings um and so letters of recommendation are really just a way to you know you're having someone vouch for you essentially and what they want to know is 
not necessarily that you're a good student, because again, that's super important, but that's already been established ideally by your, um, you know, your grades, your MCAT, you've taken it, you've shown that you know basic science. Um, now they want to know about your character. And uh, you have to think about these letter writers who you're going to ask, how are they going to comment on your character? Are they, how well do they know you? What, what parts of your character have you shown them? You know, what have you done with this person that is writing your letter that demonstrates to them that you're a compassionate person, that you're a driven person, that you care about the, the people around you, that you have integrity, you, ha you know, you have to be involved in things and not just, you know, asking questions in class. Ultimately, you know, the recommendation from what I remember has always been, you know, you have to have at least one sort of science professor letter. Um, uh, so, and if, again, you were just a student in a class of 250 people in organic chemistry at UC Davis, um, I'm not sure how much your professor is going to be able to comment about you. So if you came to office hours a lot, if you asked a lot of questions, if you you know, built a relationship with that professor, they will have things to say about you. Also your other extracurricular activities, ideally you have a few sort of longitudinal things that you've done for several years. And so that you've developed relationships with these people who've known you for quite some time, watched your progression, seen your passion and your compassion and who can comment on that. Um, and so you, you want to have those things. You can't just be a student who is really good at being a student. Just again, I harped on that a lot. It is important to be a good student, but it, you know, it requires more. Um, they, they, everyone talks about being a well-rounded applicant. You know, you, they want the MCAT score, they want the GPA, they want the good letters of recommendation, they want these uh, extracurricular experiences that show that you are interested enough in this field to spend your own time that isn't studying or you know, your own personal time on this. And you know, these extracurricular opportunities are of how you get your letters. So um, that's very important. Um, there are definitely workshops, I'm sure that you can go to that talk a lot about letters and recommendations. And so I won't spend too much time um, talking about that further, but that's all kind of part of um, you know, being, being present on campus, finding opportunities and Meeting other people, that's another thing. Meet other people who are also pre-meds. They will, you know, it's sometimes certain schools have a more of a competitive environment where people look at each other as competition and uh, that's very toxic and very unhelpful. Um, but I think the other, other side of it is that you find people who are also share your passions and um, inspire you and also that you share information. You know, you learn about which professors are good teachers you learn that from word of mouth you learn about uh, what other volunteer opportunities there are you know where you know what labs are looking for new research assistants at you know undergrad etc I, I you know i the labs that i joined uh, was ultimately because of people that i had met in a different setting other pre -meds that i had met at a um at the at the conference actually um who were also in this lab. And so I was able to easily transition, join this lab because I knew people in the lab and, and there were, they were friends of mine, pre-med friends and they could vouch for me. So um, develop those relationships with people uh, that that's gonna help you a lot along the way. So, you know, once I, you know, when I was at Davis, you know, hit the ground running, did, did a lot better in school than I had done um, in, in community college, definitely showing that sort of, um, upward trend, which again, I think is really important. Um, didn't have a great GPA in community college, definitely improved it um, at, uh, at UC Davis. And I think that was a key to demonstrating that I, I was, a, that I transitioned to being a successful student. Um, so I, I think uh, a big part of um, kind of my personal statement that I ended up writing for medical school, you know, kind of comes all back to sort of my background. Um, just being, being someone who comes from a community that was not, um, first of all, not well recognized um, because we're a sort of a religious minority group that all immigrated from the Soviet Union to um, Sacramento area. So if you're familiar with Sacramento area, you probably know some Russians or Russian speakers. Um, but, uh, you know, a, 
a working class kind of community that's not very well educated that was not not a lot a lot of opportunities in the in the old country in the ussr so not a lot of people were, were pursuing um education and so um i at, at all points of my time in undergrad and community college i tried to you know meet with other people and interact with other other uh, russian speakers who were also you know dreaming big like this um i one of the extracurricular activities that I was involved in was kind of working with the Russian refugee community. There was a professor at UC Davis who was a psychiatry professor and he looked at, uh, there's a project that I worked on with him about looking at um, you know, mental health issues in the Russian speaking community in Sacramento, um, which is kind of a passion project of mine, which is you know also something good for um, everyone to try to acquire as a passion project, something that you truly truly are interested in and can speak passionately about when you get asked about in interviews. Um, but this project was about um, identifying the need for mental health resources in a community that was not very comfortable with talking about mental health problems. Um, that still isn't very comfortable talking about that. Um, and, you know, we did a survey, we were, we were able to recognize that there actually is a need for this sort of resource. And, you know, we we're working with UC Davis to try to figure out ways to provide that it's a very challenging problem to have um, challenging problem to solve but um, again another passion project of mine that I um, still reflect on and I was asked about on interviews and again something that I could talk about because it's something that was close to home that was personal that um, was fairly unique and um, again something that I could demonstrate my um, desire to kind of help the people around me which is part of the reason why I went into medicine in the first place um, so it's hard to find a good passion project, but really um, just seek out these things that inspire you. Um, and when you talk about them, when you're interviewing for medical school, they, people will see your passion. And I think that's, uh, that, helps, that helps you stand out in the sea of students who all kind of do very similar things. Um, so ultimately, you know, graduated UC Davis. Uh, I was, at, I took a gap year, which I think is becoming more in vogue. <laughs> I applied for medical school sort of my last year at UC Davis, which means that, you know, you, you end up going to medical school the following fall. So um, I taught for the MCAT. I taught for Kaplan. Some of you guys may have probably familiar with them. I don't know the people who may have already taken the MCAT may have used Kaplan or, you know, a competitor. Um, and, you know, that, and that was a year of my life. A part of it was, um, spent in actually interestingly enough in Georgia I was sent to do this sort of MCAT boot camp where the kids would basically live in these dorms and just learn MCAT every morning throughout the evening um, and I was actually when I was there teaching a class in MCAT when I got my acceptance phone call from uh, the Mayo Clinic uh, at the time I had already been set on attending UC Davis and I was very excited very committed to that that had been the dream is to go to UC Davis School of Medicine and uh, just, you know, the local medical school, the school that I had spent so much time in doing extracurricular activities. Um, but when, you know, the Mayo Clinic called and they made their offer, I, you know, I, I was, I was stunned. I remember just, just absolutely shocked, was not expecting that at all. Um, I didn't think I would go. It was such a big move, you know, Minnesota, Rochester, Minnesota, small town. Um, I hadn't been to Minnesota. I had left the state like twice in my life before that didn't think I would do it you know but here I was in Georgia of all places teaching the MCAT and this is you know like um, a few weeks before you have to decide what medical school you go to this was late summer and I, I remember taking a flight two days later I booked the flight to um to Rochester Minnesota sort of on a whim because I knew this was a really big decision to make and I was worried and I, I just, I don't know, I flew there because I wanted to see it. I just, I needed to be real to me. Um, I flew to Rochester, Minnesota, walked around town for a bit. Unfortunately, it was Memorial Day weekend, so there weren't any students around. The school was closed. <laughs> I don't know how much I, I don't know how much I got from the trip, but, you know, I visited the city and it was real to me. Um, I mean, I obviously had been there once before for the, um, for the interview but this was in a, a sea of other interviews and I you know, didn't really see myself there. Um, you know, I talked about it with my parents and I talked about it with my significant other, now wife. 
And um, ultimately, it was just the, the opportunity to study at such a, a wonderful place that has such a um, strong commitment to excellence in teaching, research, healthcare, just such a good, excellent hospital that I, I just couldn't turn that away. And I saw it as a great opportunity to to grow a bit. I had kind of stayed home um, local my entire life. And this was an opportunity to uh, give myself some space to, um, to grow. Um, I, I had my first, you know, winter in Minnesota. That was, um, that was definitely an experience. I, I liked it. I liked the winter, I liked the seasons. It was five months long, which would make it a little bit too long for any person, but, um, coming to coming to medical school was a big culture shock. And I think that will be the case for some of you as well, especially those that don't come from very um, academic backgrounds. Um, suddenly the, this group of people is very different from the people that I grew up with this, even the students that I went with, <laughs> not a lot of people there that went to community college. So that comes with its own set of challenges. I was alone, truly alone for the first time. Uh, I'm like, what, I don't know, 1,500 miles away from home, something like that, middle of the country. Um, and so going there, I, I, you know, I tried to also hit the ground running, but it's a, you know, medical school is hard. Um, and it's, it's exhilarating too. You know, you, you feel like, I remember feeling, wow, I actually made it. Like I actually did the thing that I'd spent so many years planning for, thinking about. Um, but I quickly realized that I, medical school is also temporary. You know, the, the ultimate goal is not to go to medical school, right? It's to be, become a physician. And you have to keep that in mind once you start medical school. Like medical school is hard. It's four years. It's a lot of information being thrown at you. Um, it's a, it's just another set of challenges. Now you, all of your time is essentially monopolized by medical school. There's not a lot of free time. And that's something you may hear from other people, but it's hard to really realize until you're there that just how much you are sacrificing. And that's another thing. That's a big thing that I had always wanted to talk about when I you know, when I would ultimately start, you know, giving talks to pre-meds and that sort of thing. And people have to realize, I mean, as wonderful of a career as um, medicine is, it is a large sacrifice. You are, you have to know that you are giving up many of your best years, probably as a young person spent in a book on the computer, just studying. Um, and I don't mean to, I don't mean for that to dissuade anyone or make it sound daunting, but you know, it kind of is daunting and you will miss weddings. You will miss birthdays. You may miss funerals. And that is very hard to do. Um, you have to, and four years is a long time and you're going to be doing the same thing when you're in residency, you will be missing a lot of life. Um, and, you know, ultimately it's worth it. I think it's worth it, but it's, it's definitely a difficult thing. And it's different than just having to, you know, difficult in terms of like, oh, it's a challenging problem to solve for a test. This is socially very difficult. Um, you know, my, my family is very tight knit. I have a lot of siblings um, and I was so far away from home. It was so hard to see people. Um, and so you have to really want to do this. And I think I remember someone saying that in one of the talks that I went to as a pre-med, they talked about how you don't have to go to medical school. Not everyone has to go to medical school. And I'm not here to tell anyone here that they shouldn't, but I mean, it's also, I remember being told this, I didn't really think too much of it until later, but like, you don't, not everyone has to go to medical school. There are a lot of other fulfilling, amazing careers where you can make a big difference in other people's lives that aren't medical school. And so part of the process, part of the reason why it's so hard to get in is because they're really trying to look for the people who truly are committed because it is a commitment. It's not just, uh, it's easy to have sort of um, rose tinted glasses when you think about uh, being a physician and being, you know, going to medical school 
being a surgeon, for instance, you just think it's, it's, it's the most amazing thing. And it is, it is one of the most amazing careers I think out there, but the cost is high. You know, there's, um, there's a lot of your young years that will be spent um, either studying or in a hospital for long periods of time. There will be a lot of sleep deprivation, um, a lot of challenging social situations that you're going to encounter, dying people, angry parents, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and I, again, I don't mean to dissuade anybody. I don't mean to make it sound like it's not a, it's, um, like a raw deal or something like that. It's not, it's, it's an amazing career, but again, medical school will ask so much of you so much. So I think it's something that, and I think maybe some of you guys probably already get a taste for that now, wherever you are at, you know, whatever stage you are in, in your pre-med path, when you're taking pre-med classes and you, you know, you can't go out with friends on Friday night because you have a test on Monday and you know, you need the whole weekend to study. Um, that's a good thing. Um, so, you know, Mayo Clinic, four years, um, I had a great time. Great. I mean, in spite of all these things I talked about, all these sacrifices, you know, you still, I still had fun in medical school. I still made great friends, lifelong friends for sure. Um, but it's, it's important to realize that the, the treadmill that you're on, where you have to keep running just to stay in place, it doesn't stop right? You have to continue to keep up. And I think probably some of you guys are familiar with this concept of, you know, being on this treadmill in academics of constantly studying, constantly learning just to keep up, just to keep your head above water. And it's the same thing in medical school and the things are harder. Um, and there's also another big test that you have to study for. Things are a little bit different now because, you know, I'm talking about step one. Um, now that that's, um, now that that test is sort of being de-emphasized, I think it's pass fail now, um, which is interesting because I just kind of transitioned step two, the other test you take in medical school to just be the new step one. But it's just like the MCAT, you know, it's this big, long, daunting test that you have to take and you take it once, you get one score and that score plays a big role in where you end up. And the same sort of advice, I mean, this is, you know, years ahead for most of you guys, but it, it's kind of similar advice to studying for the MCAT. And so that's part of the reason why the schools still use the MCAT is it at least somewhat can predict your success at step one and step one or step two now can predict your success at passing boards. Because even when you're a physician, you still have to take more tests, the tests don't stop. And so that's why there's such an emphasis on test taking, because that's just not a, it's not a, it's not necessarily the best way to measure someone's knowledge, um, but it's just the the way that it, that we have and that's standardized, and so that's why it's used. And so another piece of advice is the same thing: you have to learn things the first time. If you're in medical school, you know it's year two, halfway through year two, towards the end, and you're learning these concepts for the first time. You know, it's a uh, not a great place to be in because. Um, you should be, this, this is the point where you should be reviewing all the information you had learned for the past two years, year and a half. So when you're in medical school, you have to, you know, hit the ground running and continue running again. It's like that treadmill, you know, if you stop, you can fall on your face. Um, and that's another thing to realize the, it's hard to get into medical school, but then you have to get through it too. You have to get through step one. Um, you have to get through medical school rotations. Um, you have to learn from them. Um, you have to do well, you know, to continue, you know, to get the residency spot that you want. So that's another set of challenges. Now that you've gotten to medical school, now it's all about, I have to match. I have to get a match is another stressful process. You have to, um, you know, it's a very similar to getting to medical school. There's obviously big differences too, but again, you have to demonstrate that you're a good student, that you have research abilities, you have leadership abilities, et cetera, et cetera, passion for the field all sorts of things that you have to demonstrate to get into medical school in the first place. But my, my ultimate point that I'm trying to make here is um, it doesn't stop being a constant challenge. And that's kind of the beauty of medicine, but it's also um, one of the hard parts about it is you can't rest on your laurels ever. You just have to keep going, keep learning, keep studying. Um, and if you want to be an excellent physician surgeon you have to do that and 
maybe not everybody does, but you, I assume, want to be an excellent surgeon, excellent physician, et cetera. And you want to be someone who is learning every day, who is, and so in medical school kind of force you to do it once you're in it. So um, again, it's, it's a challenge. It's amazing. Medical school is a, a very unique experience, of, you know, obviously a significant part of my life and um, made a lot of great memories there. But it, again, also challenging when you're there too. So, you know, just getting into medical school is not the end all be all. You know, you, you, you come to medical school, you have to thrive. Um, I went into medical school kind of thinking I wanted to do orthopedics. I had done this in undergrad. I had done this sort of surgical internship program. I don't think it exists anymore, but it was through UC Davis. Actually, Jubin was involved in it. Um, and so I got to shadow a lot of the um, a lot of the different surgical services. Actually, orthopedics wasn't one of them that I had seen. But seeing surgery wanted made me want to be a surgeon. Um, and I remember being frustrated by the fact that I wanted to be a surgeon because I knew it's just a long, um, it's a long road. It's a, it's a much longer training than to be an emergency medicine physician or, or you know, general practitioner. Um, but I was inspired because I remember working in the emergency department or I was, I was in the surgical program we had gone to the emergency room because there was a trauma patient that had come in the emergency doctors were working him up but when the trauma surgery resident came in you know he ran the show he knew what to do he just made the decisions that were gonna save this guy's life I don't remember what it was maybe a motorcycle crash something like that but and I was just, I was just so impressed at this, this surgeon's command of the room, his just sort of calm, you know, that there's this person that may be dying in front of him. There's all these, you know, 10, 20 people scurrying around all doing their part. And, you know, this person was like a composer, just making sure all the pieces are working well together. And I, and I realized that I wanted to be that person that could do the terminal, like not that not terminal is the right word. He would do the ultimate thing that the patient needed to live or to thrive, get back to what they wanted to do. And I think that was a big appeal for surgery. You act, you true. I mean, not always, but ideally you fix the problem. You identify it, you diagnose it, you use your hands to physically manipulate that person's body to fix the problem. And I thought that was an incredible thing. I mean, I think all of medicine is incredible, but seeing surgeons you know, turn just, uh, you know, an exploded pelvis, just bone pieces, just shattered into something that can bear weight and a person can walk again. I think, I think that was, you know, incredible. And I initially wanted to be, you know, general practitioner because I didn't really know any specialists. Why would I want to be a specialist? And then I met some ER doctors and I thought, wow, that's really awesome. They get to be heroes. You know, they get to you know, they get to save lives. But then I saw the trauma surgeons, they're really saving lives. They come into the ED and these people are broken in front of them physically and they physically repair them. And I thought that was incredible. And then orthopedics I didn't have a lot of exposure to it, but I, in medical school, very early on was, you know, was shadowing. So I would go, i scrub into cases. Um, and I, I thought it was incredible well, first of all, I, I was just blown away that you could use a large metal hammer and apply it to a person's body in a way to fix them. You know, that's uh, that was quite something to see, you know, someone use just seriously, just whacking, whacking someone's leg with a hammer with a goal of fixing them. And, hey, just admit it. Your carpenter was <laughs> surgical steel. Yeah, seriously. I mean, it. <laughs> The carpentry part's one of the coolest parts for sure. And it's not for everybody. And some people are just like astounded and they think it's like barbaric and yeah, it kind of is, but I mean, it's amazing. You, you're working with, you know, bone is very, is similar, I guess, in some ways to wood. Yeah. It's, it is very similar to carpentry, but I mean, the, the tools they were using was just awesome to me. And it kind of reminded me of all the people I knew uh, growing up who were, you know, building fences, you know, putting you know, shingles on roofs, repairing cars, using tools, screwdrivers, hammers, 
drills, saws. I, I just, I thought that was all just awesome. Uh, not for everybody for sure, but I, I thought that was stuff was so incredible. And they were, they were actually like, they were like architects and construction workers to b- both. I, I remember as a kid telling my mom once I wanted to be a construction worker and I didn't really fully let that dream die. And in some ways I am living that out just on a different scale. Um, but they, you know, you, you take, it's amazing. You take, you look at an x-ray, you see these broken pieces of bone. You look at this person's arm and there's a bend in their arm when there shouldn't be a bend that should be straight. And you open that up. You look at the fracture, you see the broken pieces of bone. You, you know, you get your metal tools, you, you know, you put your screws in, you put your metal plates in, you put your metal rod in, you bring the bones back together. You can feel the you know, the strength that you've in, imparted now with metal into this bone. And then you see this patient and they can walk and some, you know, some orthopedic surgeries, you can go from someone whose, you know, leg is smashed into pieces and you can put a metal rod in their femur and sometimes they can walk the next day. And that's, uh, I think that's an incredible thing. And that was a big appeal to orthopedics for me was just, I liked how open it was. Also, there's some surgical specialties. I think one of the decision points when someone's deciding about what kind of, if they're pretty set early on in, in medical school, you kind of, most people decide, oh, do I want to do surgery? Do I not want to do surgery? Um, and a big part of people who don't want to do surgery is they think um, it's too much of a big time commitment. It's too intense. It's too hard. It takes too much out of you. And, uh, you know, all those things are true. They are. That's a, and that, that is a good reason not to do surgery. If you, um, don't want to commit that amount of time and that amount of energy because surgery is hard. You have someone's life literally in your hands and you really have to want to do this to go through the, the sacrifice that it requires to be a surgeon. And it's amazing. You truly get to fix people. Not all the time. And there's always bad complications too. And that's the flip side. Sometimes you don't fix people. Sometimes you make them worse. Sometimes you kill them. That happens as a surgeon. You can kill people not on purpose, obviously, but you can kill people. And that's a huge burden to have to bear. And you would bear that for the rest of your life. And so, um, you know, being a surgeon is, it's very dramatic in that sense. Um, but in medical school, you kind of decide, do I, do I, am I one of those people or am I not one of those people? And if you decide to do surgery, one of the other sort of ways to think about what kind of surgery you want to do is the decision point is you want to do big surgery, do you want to do small surgery? And there's a lot of cool small surgery type stuff you could do. You know, you could do ophthalmology, you could do, you know, head and neck, or sometimes those procedures are really small. They're inside the nose they're inside the ear, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I like big surgery. I liked seeing the anatomy open in front of me. I thought that was very incredible. The stuff that you used to see in the cadaver when you're dissecting it. Um, and orthopedics is big surgery. It's, you know, big exposures you're making long incisions you're separating skin fat muscle getting inside the bone bones are deep in the body um i I thought that was incredible what you could do from like a exploded limb to making a limb that functions again you can replace the entire bone with metal that's incredible all those things were reasons why i wanted to do surgery Uh, and i wanted to do orthopedics excuse me specifically Another, another sort of beautiful part about orthopedics is that um, patients often do quite well. Not, some people really like the acuity, for instance, of dealing with cancer patients, and that's very admirable. Some people you know, will operate on people that have months left to live, um, and some people will operate on people that have a good chance of dying anyway with or without surgery. And that is, you know, that is very significant. And for me, I didn't think that I wanted to do that. And some people do, and that's incredible. And that's great that we have those kind of people, but orthopedic problems tend not to be that way. I mean, there's obvious orthopedic oncology where you're taking out, you know, these sometimes massive tumors out of people's muscles or bones. Those can be this way too. Those patients can die, but most of orthopedics tends to be people who have uh, a, a specific, often isolated problem that are otherwise healthy. And you, they come to you with this problem. They can't live their life the way they want to live. Um, you use your tools, your drills, your saws, your hammers, your x-rays, you use your hands, you fix that problem. 
this patient walks, you know, walks away. They walk out and back to their life, back to running, back to um, walking their dog, back to being a high level athlete, whatever. Um, so that's one of the beauties of orthopedics is you get to see a lot of success and that's very rewarding. And it's a lot of instant gratification. And that's one of the reasons why people go into surgery is instant gratification of taking a broken thing and making it fixed. And orthopedics is really big on that. And so uh, that was another big sort of pull for me to go into orthopedics was I wanted to, I liked the idea of being able to have discrete problems that I could fix and get this patient back to their life. Um, so orthopedics was the right fit for me there. And also, you know, um, every specialty you'll learn this medical school has their stereotypes and their own cultures. And I really like the culture in orthopedics. I just, it's hard to explain it. And every program is different, but ultimately just the, the kinds of people that were going into it were people that I felt like were my kind of people. And when you're, once you're in medical school, you'll start getting a sense for that. Um, so when I was applying for the match, um, you know, I had done sub eyes, they're called, they're basically away rotations where you're essentially auditioning for a month at these different programs. And so you would sort of travel the country and go to three or so um, in surgery, that's common. Not every specialty is common, but in sur most surgical specialties, you will be doing these away rotations. So I, I did them. I, I did one here at Stanford where I am now. Um, and, you know, Stanford was an amazing place to be. It's this um, amazing research institution, this amazing hospital, obviously a very well recognized, um, kind of a leader in essentially all fields of medicine. Um, and it was back in California. I, I miss California living four years in Minnesota. Um, and, you know, the, the people that I met at Stanford were incredible. Um, the surgeons I met there were amazing. The residents were awesome. Um, the work they were doing was just phenomenal. I, you know, I saw a lot of trauma. I saw, you know, broken things being fixed. And um, I, the people there were fantastic. And what they were doing was great. The interactions I had with the surgeons were just fantastic and so Stanford was my number one program and um, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with the match process but you essentially apply to a, it's very different from the medical school process because in the match you you find all these you essentially apply to a long list of programs and then you get interviews to these programs you go to the interviews and then after the interviews you essentially create a list of that a ranked list of all the places you want to be and then all the programs who interviewed people, they rank every person they've interviewed on a list from one to whatever, hundred or maybe more. And then there's a computer algorithm that essentially, it's kind of like the sorting hat in Harry Potter. You basically just, just spits out a future for you. You know, you, you plug in these inputs, you put in your list, these programs put in their list and an algorithm tries to essentially optimize matching so that the most people get the highest possible it's it's more complicated than that but they try to optimize it so that, the, that both the programs and the people are essentially as happy as they can be based on their list um so you know it's a big it's hard to it's hard to know where you're going to end up it's just a complete i mean you literally just open an envelope and it just tells you your future um, which is um, kind of, it's a powerful moment for sure. And it's very dramatic and it's scary. And sometimes, you know, people aren't, sometimes people are in tears, either happiness or tears of some sadness. I, I, you know, I've seen that it's hard to see. And luckily for me, I was, you know, jumping for joy because I, you know, I matched at Stanford. It was my number one program. Um, I was very thrilled to be coming back to California to be um, in great weather at an amazing institution close, still pretty close to Sacramento, close to family and becoming an orthopedic surgeon at um, this premier hospital. Um, so now I'm in my second year at Stanford as an orthopedic surgery resident. So I've done a year and a half of this now, doctoring business, bone business. Um, and it, it's been, it's been another set of challenges. I mean, um, like, like I was talking about before about like this, the, the treadmill never stops. You, I'm, I keep learning. I'm working hard in the hospital and I come home and I have to read papers. I have to read books. I have to keep learning and learn anatomy. Um, 
and at, you know, at the, when I, you know, matched and started my, you know, my life as a physician in training, it was at uh, the time, you know, peak COVID really. And so that was a kind of a dramatic thing because, you know, the hospitals were full, um, you're reading all this news, sur surgeries were canceled, people weren't, you know, people weren't coming to clinics, it was a, you know, a pretty chaotic time to train and all the social functions were closed. You know, we weren't interacting with the people in the department because none of the in-person stuff was available. Um, so it was, a, you know, that was, it was a tough transition because, um, you know, obviously in this very like world defining event, you're, you're, um, you know, starting your medical training, um, you know, for orthopedics, obviously it's not that <laughs> intimately tied with a mostly pulmonary disease like that COVID is, but um, you know, it's still, you know, so we weren't, I wasn't called to do, you know, staffing ICUs or anything like that. Although some, one of my classmates was, um, you know, it still, you know, played a big role in how we started out and, um, things have, and things have changed, you know, for even, even still very little in-person stuff. Um, surgeries are back to going again. Hopefully that stays that way. People are still coming to clinics again, but that was a whole nother, um, set of challenges and obstacles and honestly i think uh the, the year after was even harder for people because they couldn't do away rotations um so it's also an inspiring time to be um, a physician and surgeon i think with all the attention on you know our healthcare system and our healthcare workers you know you're you see these other workers making a big difference and saving lives and you kind of remember why you did all this in the first place why you sacrificed all this why you wanted to join their ranks um, so I'll probably conclude my rambling spiel at this point. Uh, happy to take questions. Um, you know, I'm having a great time at uh, Stanford now with orthopedics and seeing consults and making bones straight again in the emergency department. And I could talk about that. Um, I'm definitely happy to talk uh, also about, you know, the community college stuff that I talked about too, getting into medical school. MCAT, all that kind of stuff. If you have any questions about that, I'm definitely more than willing to share whatever insights I have. Of course, everything, you know, all the advice that I would be giving and I have already given should be taken with a grain of salt. It's, you have to really consider, does this apply to your situation? Does this make sense for you? Because everyone's different. Everyone's journey is different and their challenges are different. Um, so I'm happy to give my perspective, but I definitely don't have all the answers, but I'm happy to I have a lot of opinions, if not the answers. Um, oh, so and I'm happy you, to share those. How did you study for the MCAT and how long it took you to study for the MCAT? Oh, yeah. Good question. I had meant to talk about that. So, oh, and then what did you do What you were studying for the MCAT? So I, I took a Kaplan course, courtesy of Jubin, actually. Um, so I got, I got a free course when I was working on um, the conference. And, and I think a big thing was taking practice tests that is by far in the way the most effective method for doing well on the MCAT is to take practice exams so you have to think about it this way what what specific skill is the MCAT testing and it's literally answering MCAT questions right that sounds kind of stupid and redundant but that's literally that's an important point you have to simulate that as much as possible to get better at it you have to practice the specific skill that you'll be forced to do and that is taking mcat style questions and so if you're not comfortable taking mcat style questions by the time you're taking the test you may be in trouble so all the all the major um, testing companies i think provide these test banks, old exams, and you can also find them online. You can buy them from the double AMC, I believe still. Um, but a big thing is you have to take <clears throat> questions. You have to do these questions. You have to do a lot of them. You have to simulate sitting down for, what is it, seven hours now that a test is? That's, a, that's not something anyone's used to. So that you'd have to do that several times. Why I have a lot of opinions on uh, actually studying for the MCAT because I think a lot of people, and, and I saw that too when I was an MCAT teacher for a year, people fall into the trap of studying just the content. You get these books and you have to learn all these, you know, millions of facts and they just work through the books and they 
avoid taking tests because they don't feel like they're ready yet. Like they don't know all the content. They haven't mastered it yet. And really, in reality, you will not master the content. There's just too much. You, it's really, it's an unrealistic goal to read all the books front to back, every word, and master every concept, and then start taking questions because you don't have enough time for that. And what ultimately happens, you ask everyone who takes the MCAT afterwards what they wish they had done more of. And they're going to, a lot of them are going to say, I wish I'd taken more practice tests because you spend all this time studying for content, which is great. But the MCAT can't peer inside of your brain and see what you know. All they can see is the answers you put down on these multiple choice questions. And so you better be doing these multiple choice questions and a lot of them because you'll be doing a lot of them on test day. Um, so I think generally I took maybe seven weeks. To, I, honestly, I, it's hard for me to even remember anymore. But I you know it was probably what is it two months? Is that the, the typical thing? I think maybe around two months, maybe a little bit less. Um, the first I split it up into roughly two blocks. I mean, I, I went to the course you know that the Kaplan had, and that was nice to have some structure. But I focused the, the first half on content review, and then the second half more on just hammering home any points that I had missed on tests, but really focusing on taking a bunch of tests. And there's a lot of them. You probably won't do them all. And if you want to do them all, it's a great goal. That ensures that you do a sufficient amount to do well. Um, so I would definitely do that. I try to build a routine for myself. Again, this is, uh, I'm speaking as someone who wasn't a great student to start with, didn't really develop good skills until later. I, I It was important for me to develop a routine. So actually one of my roommates at the time was also studying for the MCAT. And so we would just wake up and we would go to the 24 hour study room at UC Davis and we would just hunker down, bring the snacks, food with us. We would just take, you know, take our books with us, slam through a couple tests, you know, read, 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 and then come home at eight o'clock, unwind for a bit, relax, and then go to sleep and do the same thing again. And I just did that for a day and then the next day and then the day after that. And that was a huge, um, and I saw my test scores jump when I started doing that. I initially started studying alone independently and was kind of falling back into my old ways of just kind of just reviewing the content, kind of passively reading the books. And, you know, I really wasn't learning. I was kind of avoiding the test. Everyone avoids, you will see, you will find yourself probably trying to avoid taking a lot of questions because they're daunting, they're hard, they're uncomfortable to do because they're long. The stems are long, the questions are hard, it's demoralizing when you don't get the right answer. And so it's tempting to avoid that and then just reading the books. You're comfortable reading books. You know, you've been doing that, you know, your entire educational career. Um, but you have to really lean into it. You just got to start taking tests and you learn from them. You, it's when you learn, when you get a question wrong, you know, your goal is to figure out why you got that wrong, what piece of knowledge you were missing, learn that knowledge, go back into the book if you need to, and then go to the next question. So that's a big, that was a big thing for me. I, I, I'm a very strong advocate of practice questions and flashcards too, to a lesser extent. It's also important for memorizing names of molecules, for instance. There's really no other way to learn them than by rote memorization and flashcards. Like Anki is a good flashcard app that you can get on your computer that can help you memorize things that just require repetition. Um, how, many, how long of a, a gap year do you take and what did you do? So my gap year was one year. I applied to medical school in my senior year of college. And so <clears throat> I was doing secondary. I, I, I did that on purpose. I liked that because then I had the summer. I wasn't in school anymore. I had the summer to prepare my application, finish up my personal statement, and work on secondary applications. And secondary applications are a, a big challenge because... You apply to, I don't know, I applied to, I think, 31 schools. I don't know what the trend is anymore. Californians tend to apply to more because um, we have so many pre-med applicants. So I think 30, when I applied to 31, I think that was pretty standard at the time for other people that I knew. I might have applied to slightly more, but that means that you're doing maybe, most schools now have a secondary, and, that, and a secondary application is just basically to ask for more information from you, and um, really that comes in the result of, you just have to do a bunch of, uh, write a bunch of essays. And so every school is going to have their own essay prompts. And a lot of times it's something you can reuse. Certain, a lot of schools have similar sounding essays, but you end up writing a ton of essays and sometimes just submitting random other paperwork they're requesting. So that becomes a, a job in itself. 
And so I was, I was happy that I had a gap year in which I was teaching for the teaching for Kaplan, but it wasn't like, it wasn't full time. And so I had plenty of time to um, do my secondary essays, write all these essays, you know, go on interviews, prepare inter for interviews, et cetera. And in the meantime, also making some money and keeping my um, science knowledge sharp by continuing to engage in the material that I learned as a pre-med. Um, and and I, that, was, that was a great use of my gap year. I don't think I would have done anything differently. The other question is, um, your, I don't know if it's about your pre-med, med student or resident, about your experience in the ED. Um, um, I don't know if it's. I oh okay. I, I can talk about my experiences in ED at multiple times in my um, career. I guess. I mean, I I don't think I'd ever been to an ED as a patient. Uh, I think the answer is no. So my first time was you know as a volunteer in community college, and I just I helped restock gloves mostly. You know, <laughs> like I. <laughs> I, you know, I wore, I don't remember, I think purple scrubs and I, you know, stuffed the boxes of scrub, uh, boxes of gloves with more gloves. I gave patients blankets, maybe got the attention of a nurse or something if a patient needed something. And that was, you know, that was pretty much it. Uh, I, I don't think that that experience, you know, that was, that was interesting. Um, I got to see some ED stuff. I don't, probably wasn't, that wasn't a big formative experience for me, particularly at that stage. And then I also... There was, a, there was a brief moment in which I thought I would want to be an EMT. And so I did take an EMT class. And, you know, we, part of the EMT experience to get your certification, you have to spend an X amount of time with like certain shifts. And so I spent some time at Mercy San Juan, which is actually where I was a hospital volunteer. Um, and I remember seeing some, you know, some really cool cases. I remember bagging, you know, bagging someone's face, giving them, you know, air. That was interesting. I remember actually seeing, uh, you know, arterial bleed and orthopedic surgeon being there. Um, that was an interesting experience for me. And then I went down to the ED sometimes when I was in the, you know, the pre-med surgical program because we were on the trauma surgery team. And so the trauma surgery team would go down to the emergency room if there was a trauma. And so, and that was actually where I kind of saw <clears throat> the different roles you know, the ED physician versus the trauma surgeon. And uh, I found that the trauma surgeon's role was compelling. And that's when I switched. I wanted to be ED physician until I saw what the trauma surgeon was doing. And I was like, wow, I think I want to do that instead. Um, so that it was, you know, that was a cool, uh, cool experience. It's formative for me and just seeing um, what these people are actually doing. I think, and I think the emergency room physicians are great. And I think it's an excellent career choice and definitely on my list of things maybe I would have done if I hadn't done orthopedics, but I don't know. I thought surgery was cooler. The other question is um, uh, about starting an AMSA chapter. I, it's, I think the, the moral of the story is not like an AMSA chapter. You could start a pre-med group at your school it mm -hmm. could be the left-handed pre-med <clears throat> student group or sure. whatever group you want. Uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Ivanov is talking about AMSA. It's just something that he saw or what was your affinity to AMSA or any other group? Because there's hundreds of groups. Yeah, right, right. There's other, yeah, there's definitely other pre-med groups. AMSA is just kind of the, the boilerplate one that's sort of national. So there's like a branch in like almost every college or university. And that's yeah, a great place to go to meet other pre-meds and to uh, meet speakers, go to talks and, you know, get to know physicians, residents, just a, a good mix of people who have all have different insights into this, this field. Um, so, I, you know, you don't, don't think you have to go start your own club. Uh, that's a great thing to do. And, you know, you learn leadership skills. It's also a big commitment. And you have sort of a, a finite amount of time. As I'm sure you guys realize you have to budget it accordingly. And so, um, you know, most people in a medical school, you know, were not presidents of their AMSA clubs. You know, they did a lot of other things. And so, you know, I, I think it's a good thing to do. I think you should get involved in sort of these small groups just, just for your own personal benefit. But, and if you, you know, if you want to start a chapter of AMSA, that, that's great. I think they have, at least some sort of infrastructure that will kind of help you. 
you know, they have like list, email lists for the leaders of different AMSA groups and there's like a convention that you can go to and that sort of thing, but it doesn't have to be that, you know, you could, you can also start like a biology interest group or something like that. I mean, it, it's good to show leadership and I think that's an important part of your application and it's hard to do that. You know, what, what can we be, you know, when I was a community college and what could I be a leader of, you know, I'm not going to be a leader. I mean, some people start their own companies, businesses, charities, and that's, that's very unique and that's definitely not going to be most of us. Uh, but, you know, a school club is something that's uh, very doable. So it's a good, it's a good leadership opportunity. One of the you other questions, oh, sorry. One of the no, other no. Question, questions is uh, high schoolers gaining experience to the side medical field. Uh, that's... Mm. So from a, from a high school student perspective or for yeah. current high school students? Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> yeah, that's early. I don't think you, you thought about medical school and no. high school. No, that, that thought never came into my head. But I mean, if you, you know, it's a good thing. If you are thinking about medical school as a high school student, that's good because you can be ahead of the game because you can tailor your community college or, you know, university experience to this goal. And so there's definitely advantages to knowing early. I definitely think there's big advantages to that because you can prepare accordingly. Um, how do you know that you want to do medicine? That's hard. I, I can't really answer that for anybody. How, how, you know, and, and some people kind of decide, have this like eureka moment They're like, oh, and then I knew that I wanted to be a, a physician. I never had that experience. I had a culmination of small experiences that kind of pushed me towards science and then uh, healthcare is cool, maybe medicine and, and slowly kind of drifted until I, it solidified. And I'm like, yeah, I, this is what I want to do. But that was a long series of events, and I don't think that's necessarily the way that everyone else does it. And so I don't think that's the right way to do it or the wrong way. It's just a way. But I think a big part is get exposure. You should know what it is that you're getting into. And that's actually hard because you think about medicine, you again, you talk, you have most of us have these rose cut, rose tinted glasses. We think everything's amazing. But, you know, there's a lot of uh, downsides to medicine, too. It's again, like I harped on so much during this talk is, you know, the sacrifice involved and how hard you have to work every day uh, and so you have to kind of answer for yourself do you are you willing to go through all this are you willing to give up these years of your life it's hard to know because when you're a high school student you haven't had you know you had your life experiences but the, still not not that much in, re in relation to an older person so it's hard to um it's hard to weigh that when you're still in high school what it means to give up a lot of your years um, but I think it, it's good to just get into the field. At least it's good to know, like, for instance, are you, you know, squeamish? Like if you can't stand a side of blood, you know, surgery is going to be a big challenge. Medicine in general, it's, it's gross, right? Like, there's a lot of body fluids you're going to be exposed to. Um, you're going to be touching patients. You're going to be like dealing with gross things. And so you have to real, I mean, are you comfortable with that? Like you're going to walk into a room and you're going to be like a necrotic wound in a foot or something. And that's you, you got to go. You got to go fix that problem. You have to go clean that like gross thing. And I mean, it's not gross to me. I'm kind of over it, but some people are very squeamish. So people can't stand inside of blood. So you definitely have to know if that's you. Um, and, I, and, and I think it's helpful to see the lifestyle. Like I think, uh, I think, you know, children of physicians definitely have a unique insight. And some of my friends, you know, in medical school had parents who were physicians and they definitely, you know, they saw how hard their parents worked and that may have changed with the things that they want. Oftentimes it tended to change the things that they wanted to do because they're like, oh, my dad did X and I definitely don't want to do that because he wasn't around that much. You know, he was working as, you know, working his, you know, skin to bone kind of just day in and day out, always out, always up you know, if they're you know, called in, et cetera, et cetera. And so they see the life that we, the general public don't see um, the sacrifice. So uh, it's good to get a sense for that. It's hard if, again, your parent, you know, you don't know any physicians, but and all these groups are also, AMSA groups are good to. There's also, there's also a lot of high shadowing school, high school summer programs. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think um, at one point I actually kind of want to make is, you know, you, you'll meet physicians in talks like this, for instance, and, um, you know, it's going to sound more, it's going to sound very inspirational and they're going to talk about how, you know, how wonderful it is. And it is, but you also want to see their day to day because what we say in this, in a talk 
is very different. It's not, I mean, it's not very different, but there's it's a different perspective than when you see us day in and day out working. And so you want to see that too. The inspirational talks are very good. It's good for, you know, inspiring you and, um, you know, understanding why people do this, but it's also good to see it being done. So if you, if you can have shadowing opportunities, you can see what it's actually kind of like, it's, it's hard to really experience it, but you can kind of see how hard they're working, the things they have to do to the amount of time they spend typing into a computer way more. I was shocked when I first started shadowing surgeons and I'm like, wow, they spend a lot of time on the computer. That's not something I expected as someone who had no, no information about medicine. Um, and actually that's one of the reasons why I decided not to do, I want to do surgery and not medicine is because I didn't want to just, I mean, they saw patients, but a lot of it is just dealing with information, clinical notes, documentation, lists of med med and medications, et cetera, et cetera. And I knew that wasn't for me, but I saw that, you know, it's different to, you know, it's, it's one thing to watch house MD, which, you know, I, <laughs> great show. I liked it a lot, but it's like, that's not, you know, that's not reality at all. It's a lot more reading things on computers and typing notes than, um, than it may seem. So it's good to see what that's actually like, because then you have to ask yourself, can I be that person? Can I do that every day? So seek out opportunities, seek out uh, physicians, um, shadow them, talk to them, try to get candid information from them, different than just talks like this. You know, you want like people to be honest with you. You want to, you want to hear about their bad days. You want to hear about the things that don't, they don't like, because you might not like them either. And that's going to be your life if you choose this. So you definitely want to know what you're getting into. I think that's probably the, making the main point. A, making a plug, December 27th, we have a talk with uh, a couple of medical students who are going to talk about different opportunities you could do. But also with COVID, um, things have changed quite a bit in terms of getting clinical experience and being in, in facilities. Um, one of the question I have, it's a really important one, is uh, did you include your community college grades, including the bad ones when you're applying to medical school? <laughs> Definitely I did. Uh, you have to, you have to include every single grade. You can't, you have to be honest about it too. Um, there's, I think, some audit process, but uh, if you apply to DO schools, um, if you don't know what that is, you should, you should familiarize yourself with the difference between DOs and MDs. Not the point of this talk, but if you apply to a DO school, I think they do grade substitution. So if you take a class again, then they don't, they ignore the prior grade in that class and they only count the better grade, something like that. It ends up being more, a lot more favorable to people who didn't do well initially and started doing a lot better. Um, so your average GPA works out better that way. And I remember the GPA is obviously weighted. And so you, classes that are more units are going to be weighted heavier than, you know, a one unit like seminar course that everyone gets an A in, for instance. Two things are always permanent is death, taxes, and your grades. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And grades, I mean, I, I hate I hate that so much of what I've talked about today is about, you know, getting the GPA and, and work, you know, and doing well in the MCAT, but that's just, that's how the system is. Like, that's how we are selected. And so you have to get good grades. And if you're not getting good grades right now, you start doing that. That's easy, obviously easy for me to tell you just, oh, get good grades, but you find a way to get good grades because, and also, you, you know, you want to learn this material, right? The, you are made to take these classes for a reason because they're foundational to understanding medicine, so. Anything else? Any other questions? Uh, he actually has to go in at uh, what time do you have? He has to go in pretty yeah, soon. Yeah, I have a shift. Yeah, I have a shift at six. I am night shift. So I'm the solo orthopedic person at Stanford at nighttime. So all calls go to me. So that's a tough job. <laughs> Does anybody have any other questions? Type it really fast or uh, he's going to go. Um, uh, Juven, you can also give my uh, Stanford email. Uh, if people want to email me questions, I'm definitely happy to answer them. I may not get to them right away, but I, I you know, it costs me nothing to spend a couple minutes to respond to um, questions through email. Um, All right. Yeah, I can do it. Maybe I'll just type uh, it to chat or something. Or... Yeah, chat it, type it in there. Uh, why didn't you choose DO? Um, that was the one question. Um, I didn't know much about it. I didn't really know what I, you know, I didn't know I didn't know much about it. And I wanted, because I didn't know that much about it, I wanted the, the typical traditional medical school education. Not a great reason, but I <clears throat> it just didn't really know 
it, there's a lot of historical reasons, you know, the differences between them and, and they function essentially the same when you're in the hospital, it doesn't matter what you are, but it, you know, I think a DO school, a DO degree can potentially limit you in terms of residency to a surgical field, for instance, that's not like an absolute truth, but it does make it a little bit harder. So it's more challenging. So, and you want to be clear eyed about that. So, um, you know, people who apply to DO schools tend to also apply to MD schools and they just kind of pick either MD or DO school, whatever school is the right fit for them. So explore the DO option for sure. I think everyone should. All right. Well, uh, it's 532 and you got to drive in. So we're going to let you go. Uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Ivanov, for making time um, and uh, uh, making time to come in tonight and inspiring everyone and answering all of our questions. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jubin. It's been a it's been a pleasure. It's been nice to see people face to face, but um, this is second best, I guess. Um, okay, so just send me some questions. I'm serious. I am happy to answer, and this is a great opportunity to seize an opportunity to talk to someone who's in the field that you want to go to. So please uh, send me send me questions. I'm happy to happy to give whatever insights I have that I didn't already cover today. Um, well, with that, I have to run. So have a good rest of your evening, everyone. Yeah, and I'm going to leave the session open for a couple of minutes if you guys want to download anything that uh, we posted in chat. Uh, and you could uh, download that stuff because that's not going to be available. And just take a quick um, poll if you can for us. <laughs>